Good evening. I'm going to call to order the meeting of the Whatcom County Council for September 29th, 2015. Can we have the roll call, please? Barbara Brenner. Here. Red Brown. Here. Barry Buchanan. Here. Pete Kremen. Here. Ken Nan. Here. Satpal Sadu. Here. Carl Weimer. Here. People will stand and join me in the flag salute. <clears throat> All right, just a couple of quick announcements. If you've got your cell phone with you, if you can silence it or put it on vibrate, that will help uh, keep the weird noises down in the room. Um, also, if you're handing out paperwork, we have three public hearings this evening in an open session. If you're handing out paperwork, if you can get a copy to our clerk up front, that's really helpful for keeping uh, the public records right. Um, we just uh, had a committee of the whole meeting. We already had a discussion with the Whatcom County Public Works staff regarding a potential property acquisition for the Whatcom County Flood Control Zone District. I think Mr. Buchanan has a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I do. Uh, I would move that to authorize the county executive acting on behalf of the Whatcom County Flood Control Zone District Board of Supervisors to move forward with and complete acquisition of the three properties as long as the purchase price of the properties does not exceed the amount discussed in executive session. All right, so we have that motion in front of us. Is there a second? So move. Moved and seconded. All right. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. <laughs> one other <laughs> announcement. I uh, try to plug one of our advisory committees every meeting. We have a, a, a single opening this year on the Planning Commission. And it doesn't say here which district. Do you know which district that's? Two. District 2. So if you live in District 2, there's an opening on the Planning Commission, one of the most important commissions, uh, advisory committees we have in the county. Um, there's one vacancy. It's, it's uh, for a partial term that ends uh, January 2017. Um, deadline is October 13th to get the applications to us, and you can get those either online or here in our office. Mr. Brown. And I'd just like to add that the, um, the, the past member who's leaving, uh, first off, I think he's um, I wanted to thank him for his service, but it would be particularly good if we could get someone who's also from the agricultural community to uh, participate. All right. We are going to move right into, we have three public hearings this evening, so we're going to move right into those. Um, as the clerk brings up our sign-in lists, I will explain the rules. Uh, basically, um, every person on the list, or any, even if you're not on the list, gets three minutes to speak. When it gets down to about 30 seconds, the clerk will uh, give you a warning that you have 30 seconds left, so you can wrap it up. If your name is more complicated than Smith or Jones, it's great if you can spell it for us so we get it right in the record. Um, and that's... That's kind of the rules for these hearings. The first one this is evening is a resolution approving the Whatcom County six-year transportation improvement program for the years 2016 through 2021. And there's a number of people signed up. I don't think we need a staff report on this. We've talked about it quite a bit. And we agree with that. All right. So I'm going to open the public hearing. And the first three people on the list are John Patton, Mark Greenberg, and Carol Dietrich. If you want to kind of come down up front and line up, it'll speed things along. Oh, I'm John Patton. And uh, I'll get right to the point, uh, just for sake of time. Um, I believe that the net neutrality phrase in the comprehensive plan uh, should be stricken from the critical areas ordinance. If we mandate that a person use property for one use only, and we insist on that use, then we have violated the principle of property. Excuse me just a second. This, this hearing is on the transportation improvement plan. Is that what you're speaking about? No, I'm, I'm speaking in general on critical areas. Okay, that would be great for the open session, which will follow these three hearings. Is that tonight? Yeah. Okay. Should be, I don't think these hearings are going to take very long, so it shouldn't be long. I'll be alert for that. Thank All right, you. thanks. Uh, Mark Greenberg, Carol Dietrich, and Lorraine... Uh, I think it's Baumgarten, and this is on the Whatcom County Six-Year Transportation Improvement Program. Hi, Mark Greenberg. I'm president of the Parkstone Community Association, and I'd like to speak just briefly about uh, your supporting the approval of that plan. Uh, I think the plan is, is um, good for the county. 
Uh, I want to speak um, in particular about one element of that plan that I've had an opportunity to speak with you about uh, before. I think it's very important that the plan does continue to include uh, funding for a crosswalk on Lakeway uh, in proximity to Parkstone Lane. Uh, this issue has come before you on multiple occasions. There has been a study, um, believe uh, as do others uh, in the region, that uh, the study's uh, determination uh, requires uh, continued consideration uh, and that uh, crosswalk remains uh, the most viable, cost-effective and fiscally uh, responsible solution to the ongoing issue of pedestrian and bicycle safety. So please do continue uh, to, to hold that, um, that uh, mark in the, uh, in the plan and, and, and move the plan forward. Thank you. Thank you. Carol Dietrich, Lorraine Baumgarten, and then Dave Rogers. Carol Dietrich, and I've lived on Parkstone, or Lakeway Drive, where Parkstone is, for since 1960, and have seen a great increase in traffic along there. I'm friends with the person across the Lakeway who has to come across to pick up her mail and um, have quite often walked out to help her get across the street because the traffic is just bad and it's getting worse as time goes on. So I'm very much in favor of a crosswalk in that area. I'm also a, a participant in the uh, Parkstone walking group and we have to cross that walk, the, the street every day twice. So that's my plea for a crosswalk. Thank you. Lorraine Baumgarten, Dave Rogers, and then Eileen Kadek. Lorraine, and I, I live on the Parkstone Way and right way by Lakeway, and it's very, very difficult for anybody. I see people with children trying to cross over, and it's it's just impossible. They wait and wait, and when they, I, I had the one afternoon, I wanted to get out myself, and I decided to count the cars that I had to wait for, 33 cars, and if I were walking and not going with the car, it just would be impossible. So it would be good to keep this on the list and hopefully do something about it. Thank you. Thank you. Dave, Eileen, and then Victor. I'll try it when I get to it. Yeah, Dave Rogers, I live uh, on Oriental Avenue, north of Lakeway, and I go out and walk my dog on a real regular basis. I walk around there, and I remember when they put in Parkstone, the contractor was going to put in a crosswalk, and you know I don't know what happened to the funds. Did the funds get put someplace else to benefit bicyclists? Because I noticed the bicycle lanes outside the city limits are twice the twice as wide as the ones inside the city limits. You know things like that. It's, and there was supposed to have been a, a center turn lane, too, between uh, Lowell and uh, Oriental, along with the crosswalk. Did somebody hijack the funds for it or something for benefit of bicyclists? I don't know. <coughs> That's my guess. Yeah, I don't know either. But eventually, there's going to be a fatality there, and then who's going to be uh, the culpable individual, the person with only $50,000 uh, insurance uh, liability or the county because uh, they got deeper pockets? I think the sooner it gets done, the better. Thank you. Thank you. Eileen, Victor, and then Mike Deal. Uh, the Parkstone community has been advocating for a simple, low-cost crosswalk at Parkstone Lane and Lakeway Drive for over two years. Last October, the council approved $300,000 in the 2015 budget for the crosswalk. Yet Public Works has not implemented the project. Um, Public Works' recommendation is to install a full traffic signal at Oriental and Lakeway Drive at a cost of three to four million dollars. Uh, the money would probably need to come from grant funding, um, and it would probably not be a very competitive project because of the multitude of projects elsewhere in the Puget Sound area. This would delay the crosswalk project for many years. Um, Public Works continues to say they don't want to put in a crosswalk at Parkstone because it doesn't meet warrants and would provide a false sense of security. Um, our response is that other projects have been done that don't meet the warrants. Um, the latest set of counts was done during the summer. 
Residential growth has not been factored in, nor has latent demand for walking been considered. Um, with regard to the false sense of security issue, um, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration study has shown that crosswalks are the safest place to cross. Right now, residents have to run across the street and hope cars will stop. <clears throat> Motorists don't understand that pedestrians have the right of way at unmarked crosswalks, and people don't even know, understand what an unmarked crosswalk is. Um, why should it be near Parkstone? Because Parkstone has the best sight distance in the area. Our suggested location is centrally located and could serve Oriental, Lowell, and Parkstone. Um, I'll, so what I, we're asking is to please continue to support a low-cost crosswalk at Parkstone Lane and Lakeway Drive, and please install it in, 19, in, in 2016. Thank you. Thank you. And can you give us your name just for the record? Eileen Kadish. Thank you. Victor, Mike Deal, and Cleo Callan. Hello, my name is Victor and Sarah, I-N-S-E-R-A. I'm a resident on Lowell, just uh, north and west of Parkstone. Um, I've been in that neighborhood for just over eight years. Um, my daughter goes to Geneva Elementary School, and her and I bike to school uh, just about every day. We had 130 days last year, and we're already over 20 for this year. Um, we have a very difficult time getting across Lakeway, Lakeway to drive with traffic to school, and my daughter is getting to an age where she would like to be biking independently. Um, my biggest mm -hmm. fear is that she's, there's no safe crossing of Lakeway. Um, we also are concerned we take the bus frequently, um, and the 512 runs, of course, down Lakeway through Geneva and out to the lake. Um, we regularly take the bus and also are very fearful when crossing. Parkstone is basically splits where the bus stops are for both sides of the street it would make it a lot safer for folks to get across. So I'd just like to advocate for a, for a crosswalk, for a safer walking for my family, for my neighbors, uh, for that whole, that whole area, if you consider that. Thank you. Thank you. Mike Deal and then Cleo Callan and then anybody else that wants to speak on this issue. Uh, Mike Deal, I was actually, I think I signed up on the wrong list. I wanted to talk about the Samish Way one. Okay, so we'll I'll be, back. be getting to that next. Samish, I think that is, is that part of, oh, a separate hearing. Yeah. Uh, Cleo Callan, 8024 Dean Drive, Custer. Uh, I'd like to encourage you to provide some more money for the Slater Road, Aldrich Road connection. Uh, you guys have support. I actually have a letter from the City of Ferndale City Council uh, unanimously passed resolution asking you guys to build the Slater Road connection. Uh, you have the support from the Lummi Tribe, so you know you've got an excess of 20,000 people asking you for this connection. And what I saw was you have $50,000 there to for engineering. You know that, that's really a drop in the bucket of what's required. I've been ta told by by the Lummies that. They can be very instrumental in providing grant money uh, to help with this project. The problem is that they need it to be ready to go to bid. Uh, I've also talked to some private developers who are very interested in, in probably, possibly doing a public-private partnership, which could possibly result in you guys getting two miles of road for the price of one. I mean, it's a really good deal in that respect. So. Uh, you know, I don't have anything against Horton Road. I see the administration has moved Horton Road up above uh, the Slater Road connection, even though you guys didn't put it that way. Uh, to me, the Horton Road connection is simply something to help Costco. I mean, that's my opinion. But I, I would really like to see you guys put enough money in that Slater Road, Aldrich Road connection piece to at least fund the right-of-way acquisition permitting and engineering and get that project ready to go to bid. I think at that point in time, we'll be able to find grant monies or other monies with, with public-private partnership. There's a lot of interest and want to have that connection. I know the administration is, is really not, doesn't care for that particular project, but I, there's just a tremendous number of people in the community, the business community, the city of Ferndale, the Lummi Tribe, Everybody wants to see that project built, so I encourage you just to at least put like a million bucks to that thing and, and at least get it ready to go, you know, 
get it to the point that it's ready to go to bid, and then we can see where we can get funding for the rest of it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Callan was the last one on my list. Is there anybody else that wants to speak to us this evening about the six-year transportation improvement program? Seeing no one, I'm going to close the public hearing. What are the wishes of the council? The council has no wishes. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Chair, I'd, I'd like to. Uh, you want you want to hold this in committee, or? I do. Okay. I'd like to. Okay, so I'll move that we uh, hold this in committee, Public Works Committee. I second it. Okay, there's a motion to hold it in committee, and it's been seconded. I guess I had a question for staff just about whether that causes us any problems for meeting all of our timelines. Certainly. Uh, the intention here is to uh, complete the six-year and then follow it up immediately with the annual construction program. Uh, the issues that were brought forward and discussed uh, – all the issues that uh, by the people just came up and talked. All those projects are on the six-year program in year one, so they will be part of the <coughs> annual construction program that uh, we would follow this on with. So you could certainly hold this in committee. Another way to do it would be to pass this tonight, and then we'll be back in front of you at the next Public Works Committee meeting in two weeks with the annual construction program, and we can spend our time specifically on those projects. So if we pass this this evening the way it is and we come back for the annual plan in two weeks, we can rearrange the priorities, change the money amounts? We can rearrange priorities, re rearrange amounts. We um, can? If, if you would like, yes, certainly. With a unanimous vote? No. Uh, would, that would uh, just would take a, a majority vote of oh. four. Ms. Brett. These, are, these are planning documents. These are not uh, – this is a planning document. The annual construction program is considered a financial document. Hmm. So this is, this is really a, a planning document. Uh, it actually does not dedicate any funds. Ms. Brenner. I still would like it in committee because um, I think it's important that instead of just making it look a certain way for how many, ever many weeks – at this point, there's things that we need to do that have not been done that I want to see done. Also, we got a very lengthy, almost four-page uh, comment from Jack Petrie, and there's a lot of issues in here that he wants to see us, you know, work and make sure it's in the six-year road plan, not in the annual plan, but in the six-year road plan. And some of them I don't have the answers to, and if everybody wants to go through all this stuff now, I also very much agree we haven't, you know, we got to stop with this placeholder on the crosswalk for Lakeway. It's time to be doing something more than a, cro than a holder. And I think we need to come to some decision, and I, I really think in committee we can talk about that some more. Uh, the last but not least, the, um, the uh, Slater to Aldrich. I want to see it eventually go through to uh, the Guide Meridian, and I happen to agree with uh, Mr. Callan's comments that we were never, you know, it was always Slater Road, and we were never really focusing as much on Horton. And Horton does seem to be a very special interest for one thing. Um, maybe it'll, I don't know what it'll cut down on, on other people. I, I can see it. It makes no sense except to get people to the new Costco. And there were a lot of res people... We, this was supposed to be done with money from the city of Bellingham, not with our money. And, and our road money is roads in the unincorporated area, not in the city. I, I really think we need to focus on sl the Slater Road connector because that really is for people in the unincorporated area. And uh, that's my comments. But I do think we at least, I mean, did anybody else read all four pages of Mr. Petrie's comments? They're pretty involved. And I think we should at least <clears throat> go through them in a, you know, um, discussion type of atmosphere instead of at a hearing. This thing seen. We had one meeting on this. It's a huge document. We had one meeting. And I would prefer, as chair of the Public Works Committee, I would really request and prefer that we just have at least one more meeting and committee on this, if, if it's okay. And it leaked. I mean, it's not going to hurt anything to do it. Mr. Kremlin. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Rutan. We were told at the last meeting that this uh, six-year transportation improvement 
program, uh, the projects are actually just in there in no priority order. Is that correct? Yes, you will note it. It says project number. It does right. not say priority number. Okay. They are not in so, priority order. So what we heard tonight, there, there's, there's an impression out there, and there would normally be an impression from, from the council members who didn't hear you state that at the last meeting, that they would be in priority order because they normally are. But I, I just wanted to bring, I wanted to get some Thank you. some clarity there. So I appreciate that. So uh, this is not in any any order. Uh, you know, I, I do think that this is a, a fairly entailed uh, document here. And to just pass it on the fly in spite of the fact that we're going to be doing it, you know, having staff come before us in the future, I, I think is a little premature. And I would like to see it go into the committee. Uh, this is, I mean, these, these are important projects, some more than others, but they're all important. And uh, I think it would be beneficial and prudent for the council to digest it a little more thoroughly before we act on it. Okay. Mr. Mann, did you? Yeah, <clears throat> well, we had this we had this in committee, and we did talk about a lot of these quite a bit. And I, I don't know about the rest of you. I met with some of the public works staff to get some of my questions answered. I'm comfortable sending it forward as it is. I don't feel like it's rushed or anything like that. And the, the one observation that uh, Ms. Brenner made that I want to just talk about a bit is the impression that Horton Road is for the benefit of Bellingham, or, or, and yeah, th that, that may be true, th or for the Costco. Costco, right, right. But, you know, the Slater Road connection is also, is gonna be connecting two segments of Bellingham, you know, two of the urban growth, or two of the city of Bellingham areas, <laughs> east-west. And that is, that is part of our job, but I, I think, uh, you know, the giant unincorporated area is, that's who's paying those road taxes, and um, I respect I respect your opinion on that. But I think you know the same argument could be made about Slater that you made about Horton. So I just wanted to point that out. Anyway, I'm going to vote against this uh, motion to hold in committee. We've already had it in committee. I'm ready to get get going on the work. Ms. Brenner, if you don't have to come to the committee meeting, would you change your mind? I'm not <laughs> No. <laughs> um, okay. Well, I want to. I want to comment on that. Uh, the Slater Road one is a real central one. It's not just to go um, to the edge of Bellingham's UGA. And by the way, because it goes to the edge of Bellingham's UGA, uh, the developers in, the, in that area, several of them, have offered to help pay for the thing. So we get a good, you know, um, bang for our buck by by doing that. But it also heads out to the county by Aldrich, by, um, if it goes out to the guide, by the guide, but at least by Aldrich. There, one of the reasons for that four-way stop there is because there's a lot of people coming back from the refineries at the end of the day. They want to go east. They don't want to even go north or south. They just want to go east. So they just, you know, take that and get that first, um, you know, road there to get to Aldrich and come out on, on Smith Road. So it's way more about unincorporated Whatcom County than it is about um, a, a, a project-specific goal. And that's how I see the Costco. Um, but I, you know, we're on the, the Public Works Committee and I, I just, it's not gonna hurt anything to do one more go round, especially with this information we got from Jack Petrie and I don't understand it all. And I don't want to spend hours tonight going through what he wrote us, but if anybody read it, can anybody else answer all his questions? Because I can't. Mr. And Thank you. Um, my inclination is to, to put it in a committee, but if there is a, a, a severe or significant time constraint, we have the public works director in front of us, and maybe we can hear from him. Uh, just what those constraints are. Yeah, let me just say that uh, that in terms of cons time constraints, um, there are no uh, there are no pressing uh, there is nothing pressing to get this passed immediately. That said, 
this is probably not the right document to be having these kinds of uh, debates about. And I say that what we want to do is get on to, to uh, contemplating what our six-year program is going to look like because it, those conversations, of course, will lay out the dollars the, and the financing for the projects that we're going to implement in 2016. Commit and our one-year program. Yeah. The one-year program. I, I'm sorry, I misspoke. And, and if you uh, back away from that for a moment and take a look at page 242 of the, uh, of the proposed six-year, you will see in no order of priority, as uh, Councilmember Kremen noted, uh, there are three R6, R7, and R8 uh, projects that are focused on the Slater Road intersection, the Slater Road extension, and all of the ancillary um, investments that need to go into that. Uh, it is funded at a modest amount so that the pr so pre-design, any pre-design that needs to get accomplished can get accomplished in 2016 uh, pursuant to the direction that comes when we put together the, uh, the one-year program. Notice also that Horton Road uh, at R5 has $1.2 million associated with it. That's there because at the present time, a de the developer who in the city limits is proposing to, uh, to, uh, to accomplish their uh, development goals by finishing out Horton pursuant to the city's needs. And of course, the extension of that goes right through uh, into the county and ties up into Northwest. The $1.2 million would be developer dollars that would go into the design of the county's portion. It doesn't speak to the construction of Horton. And uh, that conversation has yet to be made or has yet to be uh, discussed with you all and when that construction might happen. In, in my estimation, that's still out in 2019 or beyond sometime. So the point is that th those dollars are for, for <coughs> P and E for uh, purchasing right of way and for engineering, nothing more. There are developer dollars. There's also uh, a, a grant uh, that will likely be associated with that uh, that uh, engineering as well. So all of those projects exist in the 2016 plan or a program, and uh, the same goes for uh, the Lakeway Crosswalk. If you go down to 31 and 32. The uh, full suite of issues that were brought up by uh, the folks who, who testified a few moments ago are captured in those two. There's $400,000 uh, that carries over from uh, last or from 2015 uh, that is earmarked for a crosswalk somewhere in the vicinity of Parkstone. The decision of exactly where that goes and the safety considerations and those sorts of things have yet to be decided by you and will be be bringing forward that conversation as we get to the annual program. So I, I'm, in summary, I think moving this forward would be useful. It would queue up the conversations that these folks have asked you to have and uh, put us on track to resolve those as we get into the annual program. So if I may continue, Mr. Chair, briefly. Uh, so am I correct to take from what you just conveyed to us uh, that <clears throat> if we move forward on this this evening, we still are able to make modifications, adjustments, repri or prioritization from any of these on here, correct? Yes, yes, within, yes, absolutely. And so nothing is, nothing is cast in stone here? Right, this is not a priority list, so okay. prioritization can happen. And of course, uh, the, the limitations that I'm thinking about, if we have grant dollars, for example, uh, earmarked for a project that we've been developing over the years uh, because it's been in the six-year plan year after year. Of course, those dollars will be earmarked for a certain project and, and uh, because of an outside funding source has granted them for that project, we won't be able to simply move those from project to project. But otherwise, absolutely. Okay, Mr. Chairman, after hearing the response from our very deaf and Long qualified uh, <laughs> public works director. Uh, I, I'm going to withdraw my motion. All right. The motion has been withdrawn. We don't need to talk about that anymore, but we need a motion to move this forward. And so move. Mr. Mann has moved it, has been seconded to move the six year road program forward. Mr. Sidhu. 
Uh, I just wanted to make comment that in, in my meeting with the staff, uh, I was told that this is a process which goes through every year. They add the new year and drop one year, so it's like a six-year uh, vision window or lookout window that the, the department plans their projects out. So it's like dropping 2015, adding one more year to it, and, and that's what has been expressed here, that the real spending money or financial document is going to come when we do the annual approval. And, and, and council has all the authority to, to change that. That's it, thank you. Ms. Brenner. Well, while that's correct, you still have to renegotiate the other years, and you don't do that in the annual one. The annual is about 2016, and some of these are going to be probably multi-year projects. And my concern is that we say we want to do something, and they'll say, well, we can't get that all done in 2016. Do we have to go back then and redo the six-year road plan? And if we do that, do we get, does that have to be a, a unanimous vote? The answer to your question is no. So in the event, for example, that we, uh, that we in the annual program want to move, you all want to move a particular project forward, and that's something we can't get done in one, one fiscal year, then we would, of course, roll that forward into next, the, the remaining part of that work into the following year and continue it then. So you'd roll it into the six-year road plan? It, yeah, it would, it would become, it, it's already in the six-year road plan. But I mean, you, if, we want to, if we want to allocate more money for a project that's going to have to be spread out in more than 2016, you're saying that we wouldn't have to have another special vote on that? We can handle that in an annual uh, in the annual road plan? Yes. All right, we have the motion. Wait a minute. Chairman with public works, I just wanted to clarify something. You know what? This is my 13th year or two in this. I think once the annual construction program matched the six year identically, we always have made changes, or you, you have made changes, or things have come up, new information. So it's not uncommon. In fact, it's more common for the annual construction program to be slightly different from the six year than it is to match it exactly. All right, so we have the motion in front of us. I'm going to vote in favor of the motion. I, I think the annual plan is the place to have some of these discussions about like how to move the, uh, the crosswalk forward as soon as we can and those types of things. I also see a whole lot of stuff going on at Slater Road, so I'm not particularly interested in, in rushing that one forward. I understand why people that have development interest at Slater Road want to see us do everything as quick as we can out there, but there's a whole lot of rural residents that don't see what's coming at them out there with all these new road projects, and I think they need a little more time to digest this. So I'm fine with it being on the plan the way it is at this point, and we can talk, discuss it during the annual plan. Any other discussion? What? Just briefly, Mr. Mr. Chair, uh, I just want to note that there is, as already has been stated, $400,000 for the uh, the Lakeway crosswalk. So uh, there's already funding there. I know that some of our council members have other concerns, but I'm, I'm satisfied to move forward. We still have time and opportunity in the future to to fine tune and hone this, this six year transportation improvement program. So I, uh, I'm gonna be supporting this. Ms. Brenner. Well, I'm, yeah, I not only support the crosswalk, I want to see it going. And we, we've had this placeholder over and over again, and it hasn't moved. And that's what's concerning me. So um, I just don't want to end up with somebody saying, well, you know, it is what it is. We'd have to start at a different place now. They've already done more than enough uh, evaluation of the area, and the council majority doesn't agree with the administration on it. And I just don't want to see it hung up because there's still that argument going on. Mr. Buchanan. When does the uh, six-year plan get submitted to the Council of Governments? Chair Rutan, uh, 
immediately upon its adoption, we'll send it to them and update the state STIP with this information. Okay. Oh, I have one more question. Ms. Brenner. Um, regarding Slater Road, before you get too comfortable, Joe, uh, regarding Slater Road, didn't you say that we, uh, we have got grant money for uh, that? There was a grant funds of about a million for the Horton Road project. The Slater Road oh. project did not compete well for that funding. And Could you was, tell me why? Because uh, the, we did a joint application with the city of Bellingham, and the funding, the grant funding, gave a lot of points for multiple funding sources, and we had the city, developers, and us, and it gave a lot of points for a completing a link, and that would complete that link. So we got a lot of, we got, we scored well. So and why didn't you submit a proposal with the Lummi Nation, the city of Ferndale, and Whatcom County on the other Slater Road project? That uh, it was not that developed yet in us, for us to do that. Uh, we were successful um, with your help in getting $21 million for the uh, interchange at Slater. Yeah, but I met with um, uh, somebody who was representing the developer or the engineer or something. They most certainly did have a very specific Yes. Route and engineered design and everything. Yeah, and, that, and uh, the county did acquire the right of way back in the 80s, uh, to that goes along the Klein right of way. So, right. Uh, um, yeah, the, the 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 Horton Road project just competed well and was was able to get a million in grant funds for. Uh, and you didn't region. even try with the other one. We uh, certainly looked at all. We only submitted one. We ran all the different projects to see which one scored best and would compete most for the funds. And Horton was by far the superior project to submit. And, and it was competitive in one. If we'd submitted Slater, we wouldn't have gotten any funds. We wouldn't have gotten what? It, we wouldn't have gotten any funds. It would have. It's the STP grant funds that yeah. are competitive. And uh, the, we uh, had to compete against all the other different uh, small cities and entities in the county. And, and that project scored very well. And okay, the Slater, it, simply the Slater project just didn't score based on the criteria of that grant. Well, you just said it was based on that it wasn't the work, there wasn't enough work done on it. Well, the grant had different things that you scored on, different criteria, and it, the Horton project happened, and I, I pointed out a few of the, the, the issues that it scored high on. Multiple funding sources. It well, was which already, we would have had. The with city you. was um, going for construction funding for their portion, so there was a surety that you know they were granting construction to the city and PE to us, and that's simply how we got that that million dollars. When's the next time you can apply for that funding? That funding source is um, biannual. But there are certainly other funding sources that we will be uh, going in. During my presentation earlier on the six-year program in the committee, we uh, spoke at length about coming back to you in 2016 with a plan for out there, a development plan that, that you know, deals with the sequencing, what projects, and the different funding sources. Mr. Brown. I, I think it's just worthwhile remembering that you know, on the road capital construction projects, we currently have 32 listed. 30 of those um, were identified before the, the um, for example, the Parkstone community ones were done. Each of those 30 projects that was identified beforehand affects different communities around the county, and those citizens have got I know a, that. They, those citizens have got an expectation that their needs are going to be met. Our ability to do this, the speed in which we can do this, and the priority is a function of how much those citizens are willing to have themselves taxed and how much the state and the feds are willing to, to contribute. So I, I think, you know, we just have to be mindful that we can't just sort of take a pet project and throw it to the top of the list um, because everybody else has got an expectation of their, their projects being met as well. Ms. Brenner. Not only was it not a pet project, it made a lot of sense to me. And just because you don't agree with me, don't call it a pet project of mine. This was something that we have talked about for years. And to have this stalled now, um, with, I thought that money that we were, that part of that money we were getting was going to be for the Slater Road one to Aldridge. I didn't realize it was going to be all tied up with Horton. And um, so I don't, didn't understand that. But this thing about people not being involved and knowing about it 
this has been on our agenda for a long time. I don't want to, that's my opinion. All right, we've got the motion in front of us. I'd love to vote on the motion. Me too. Me too. <laughs> All right. Any other discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? No. That passes six to one with Ms. Brenner opposed. And so go, so there goes my uh, prediction for short hearings this evening. <laughs> uh, I'm going to back up just a second because I made a mistake during the uh, general announcements. I said that uh, during, that there's an opening on the planning commission and that there was a deadline for applications on October 13th. That was incorrect. We're going to announce what, when the deadline is on October 13th. So there isn't a deadline yet, but please apply as soon as possible. All right, we're going to move on to our second hearing, which is an ordinance establishing a reduced speed limit on a portion of the Samish Way. And let me find the, the sign-in list. I'm going to open the public hearing. The first three people that have signed up are Paulette Peterson, Adam Morvey, and Mike Deal. If you folks are here, come on down. weekends of the summer and things like that. On a day-to-day -day basis, there's nothing going on there. So it just seems a little silly that we all have to deal with the few weekends that it happens. And I, my other question would be, um, I've seen these zigzag lines in the paper and things alerting drivers that there's like trails or something coming out so that you get a little more aware to be careful. Maybe this is all we would need for to get this thing settled. It may help instead of reducing the entire speed limit. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Adam Morvey and then uh, Mike Deal. Hi. Adam Morvey, M-O-R-V-E-E. -E. I am a resident on Sandwich Way, about three-tenths past Galbraith Lane, south of Galbraith Lane. I've been there approximately seven years. So in those seven years, I've seen a significant increase in traffic, specifically at the Galbraith parking lot. Uh, and actually, just this evening, uh, on the way here, there was 11 cars parked on the side of the road overflowed from the parking lot. So it's not just weekends, it is on a daily basis. Uh, but I, So I am in full support of the decreased speed limit, uh, but I would also like to request to eliminate the entire 50 mile per hour zone. Uh, the proposed uh, decrease is for 500 feet past Galbraith Lane which leaves approximately six-tenths of a mile of 50 mile per hour zone. Uh, I believe that would be a decreased cost in uh, eliminating the entire zone. Uh, for less signage would be needed for reduced speeds and additional 50 and 35 mile per hour zones. Uh, some of the safety related concerns, uh, sorry, I just kind of threw this together on my way here real quick, so it's not uh, completely in order, but I'm just gonna go through some of the bullet points I wrote down. Uh, so we have increased residences on, Gal uh, on Galbraith Lane as well as Sandwich Way. There's many developments in that area that have been growing and are continuing to grow. Uh, we'll have a likely decrease excessive speeding. So we have continued excess of 50 miles per hour, uh, at, especially with the 500 feet. I don't believe that people will be able to slow down from 50 miles an hour to a safe speed when they're approaching the Galbraith Lane parking lot. Uh, it also increased the safety of the pedestrians throughout that entire 50 mile an hour zone, uh, especially cyclists. All of Sandwich Way is a large cycling route. It's also a route for many race events in the area. Uh, also will decrease the road noise in the area, which has significantly increased since the recent chip seal. Um, also, icy conditions in the winter are a safety concern, uh, specifically south of Galbraith Lane in that 50 mile per hour zone uh, gets very icy. There's many vehicles that go off the road every year I see in the ditches, specifically in that area. So I believe that reducing that from 50 to 35 may help. 
uh, the safety of, of that in the wintertime. Also, I'm not uh, positive on the specifics, but I would imagine that less road maintenance and expenses would go into that road if it was reduced to 35 miles per hour. Um, I would just suspect that a higher rate of speed would damage the road uh, sooner than, than later. Uh, that's all I have. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. Deal. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mike Deal and I reside at 1250 Sandstone Way. I live about three-tenths of a mile north of the uh, Galbraith Lane parking lot off of Samish. Um, I ride by there probably three or four days a week up in the mountains. And again, to Adam's point, uh, there was at least a dozen to 12 cars earlier uh, today there. So it's not just on weekdays or weekends and sunny weather. It's, it's getting to become a year-round pattern. People from Canada down to Seattle, all over the Northwest come and ride Galbraith Mountain. Um, and so having lived uh, there in, uh, in the sandstone neighborhood, there's about 18 to 20 houses up there. And um, we have kind of a particular area where we live. We have to pull out onto Samish Way. If you're going north into the city, um, the speed zone changes right in there from 35 to 50. And um, there's been residents in my neighborhood that have seen many times where cars will attempt to pass. The speed limit changes to 50 right there. Okay, you can speed up and start going around uh, the slower traffic. And uh, I've even had cars coming head on as I pull out of Sandstone Way it's going north. So I think that extending that 35 mile an hour zone down well past the Samish Way parking lot is going to be a, a big safety uh, increase for the bikers, the hikers. Um, lots of people can use that parking lot to access the pattern, the, the uh, Lake Padden, Padden trails, as well as, as, well as uh, Galbraith Lane. So I'd like to see it extended. Thanks for your time. Question for Mr. Deal? Uh, Mr. Deal, um, what, what's your opinion about extending the 35 limit all the way down to the freeway? You know, I haven't done any measurements, but it, it just kind of makes sense to me because the, the speed limit's going to change again right there around the, the gun range. Um, I'm not sure exactly where. So it just it doesn't make sense to go from 35 up to 50 and then probably within, I'd say, less than a half a mile, it's going to change right back to 35. Yeah, so it's a very short distance. I'm, I'm, just, con so I'm concerned it's going to turn into a speed trip. Sure, that, that could be, if it, you mean if it goes to 50. Well, yeah. if it's only, if, if it's a 50 miles, if yeah. it's 50 miles an hour for half a mile, people are going to get confused. Yep. Yeah. So, okay. thanks for your time. Thank you. Anybody else want to speak to us this evening on the speed limit on that portion of Samish Way? If there's anybody else, come on down front. We'll get you next. Hi, everybody. My name is Eric Brown. I'm the trail director for the Walker Mountain Bike Coalition. Um, <clears throat> I would like to kind of bring a different perspective, which are the neighbors on Galbraith Lane, which is the reason why this has been brought up in the first place. Um, they are pulling out off Galbraith Lane on Samish Way with 50 mile an hour with a lot of traffic, a lot of parked cars, and it was a real concern for some of their um, citizens there who were having hard times seeing. And there's, I know you're, you have another resolution that you're going to talk about with no parking signs. So it was a combination of the, of the parking on the north side of Samish Way along with the 50 mile an hour signs. And, um, and I, can, I actually concur with with, with Adam and um, Mr. Deal and the fact that it's not uh, just a sunny weekend thing anymore. Um, you know, we had a really sunny <laughs> April no, all the way into August and basically you, you see dozens of cars out there on the weekends, correct? But on just on a normal week, weekday like today, you see a dozen cars out on that road. And um, it's, we have mountain bike clubs that go um, from the parking lot to there and um, it's oftentimes one of the one of the people who leads the, the the Wade King Mountain Bike Club this past year said the scariest thing for his entire club is not actually riding on the trails on the mountain. It's actually getting them from the parking lot to Calvert Lane, um, and that's a real concern for us. Dogs have been hit, other things, and I know that's that's on the dog owner's fault. They need to have it on leash, but that's and and there's kids and people, and also when you um, there's, it's a big road riding area, so people ride their road bikes out that way over to old Samish, around Samish Lake, et cetera, so, or Lake Samish. So 
Um, yeah, so we, we obviously were in favor of it. Um, I know it's going to slow people down a little bit who are trying to use that as a, as a thoroughway thorough or, you know, corridor for them to commute. I understand that's a pain in the butt for them. But on the other hand, it's a public safety issue for us. So that's, that's my, my statement. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Anybody else? Seeing no one else, I'm going to close the public hearing. What's the wishes of the council? I'll move approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Mr. Brown. I'd like to propose amending it so that it extends all the way down to um, the freeway. Or down to the, the, the next logical change. All right. So there's a motion to amend I, to extend it. I would accept that as the maker of the motion. Am I allowed to do that? But I would want to talk to our road transportation engineer first. Jerry Town Public Works, we uh, struggled with that very much so and spent a lot of time discussing where we should go with how far we should extend that. It does not meet warrants past this area. It, it, the, the speed limit, the 85th percentile is about 50 miles an hour. We're comfortable with changing it up past uh, Galbraith there because we were spe seeing speed differential as people were approaching that area of, of Galbraith, because of all the cars, because of all the movement, they were slowing down. And really, the speed limits, when there was a lot of traffic out there, by the, by the uh, Galbraith intersection was about a little over 40 miles an hour, which is pretty close to the, you know, that's where we want our 35 mile an hour roads to work. This will be a little bit of an um, enforcement issue from where it goes to 35 now up till Galbraith, and it would certainly be an enforcement issue past Galbraith down to Samish if indeed we made that 50 miles an hour. I know that's a little confusing, yeah. but the, the intention here is, you know, and I went out and drove it, because I, I, I asked that very question when the traffic people brought this to me. So I've driven it in a car, I've driven it on a motorcycle, and I biked it <laughs> just to get a feel for it. And um, I'm very comfortable with our recommendation, Pueblo Works recommendation, of 500 feet past that area because you were going to introduce speed differential, which is really as much of a problem as speed itself. If you spent, set the <coughs> speed limit artificially low from this point down to Sandwich, that would be our concern. But when does it convert back to 35 miles? It converts back to 35. Um, it's, uh, it's, I think he said 0.6 of miles. It's 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 down at the uh, interchange with Samish, I-5 in Samish, and I, I I actually I specifically asked that of my traffic section because I was a little bit leaning towards that. And when I went out and drove it and looked at it, it changed my mind. Mr. Mann, I'll leave you with that. Uh, I, I I was confused a little bit by something you said, Joe. So that's 80, not uncommon. No, it isn't. <laughs> Eighty-five percent. Of them are traveling at 50. I mean, isn't that because it's marked yeah. as 50? I shouldn't have used that term. What 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 the 85th percentile is is a um, common engineering term that we use. Most people are going to drive a road what's comfortable and safe, and that's what's called. That's about 85 percent of the people are going to drive a road what it naturally feels comfortable to drive at, regardless of what that black and white sign says, that speed limit sign. We try to find that 85th percentile and recommend to you that the speed limits be set at that 85th percentile. So when we widen and straighten roads, we're basically just encouraging people to drive faster. And potentially they could drive faster, but accident rates will go down. Um, the number one thing we can do to make a road safer is to put a shoulder on it, a clear zone recovery area. Speeds will go up, accidents and fatalities will go down. So shouldn't we just take down all our speed signs and put up signs that say um, drive and you and you've, and you've heard me say that before. <laughs> you've heard me say that before. The black and white sign tells the police officer what he gets to write the ticket for. It doesn't influence driver behavior that much, as much as we'd like it to. What dr influences driver behavior is the geometrics of the roadway, which is what traffic calming is. It's getting people to feel less secure driving, safe, driving fast without making it dangerous. Could, I think the way I'm looking at it is the, the whole process of changing 50 to 35, the amount of time it has taken from the 
uh, not only the staff, the department, the council, and everything, and we are leaving like half a mile in between and change again, and we'll be going through this another two years, we'll be restarting this whole process again, and why don't we just do it now? Um, could I interject for a minute? I think you have a problem with um, this not being advertised for a public hearing to make that change. So I don't think you could make that change tonight. I think you would have to re-advertise it for a public hearing. So if we wanted to make a change, we'd either have to do it as a separate thing or hold this and add it and re-advertise it. I think so. Okay. To me, that's fine. I mean, we spent so much time and spend another two weeks uh, Mr. Brown, just, just for clarity, then, Mr. R Mr. Rutan, just just for clarity, at the moment it's 35 miles an hour until you get to roughly was it, I can't quite read it, uh, Prichter Street. Correct. Prichter, right. And then you're proposing, ex and then it becomes 50 miles an hour, and then you're proposing to drop it to 35. 35. Down to just south of North Galbraith. 500 Lane. feet past Galbraith. But how long does it stay at 50 miles an hour before it, then it becomes goes 35? To, goes to 50. And it, it is, I mentioned, I think someone said it was 0.6 miles. I believe it was a little over that. It's not, it's not quite a mile. It is a wide open straight road with a large shoulder and 35 feels abnormally slow. People will not drive it. And we're going to have a continual problem with people calling us up and, and the sheriff saying people are speeding out here. And then it becomes an enforcement issue. And then you do get speed differential. You, you do get people who will, my sons, who are just learning to drive, will go 35. And then they're going to have other people going 50. And it's speed differential that can cause as much problems as speed itself. Okay, so doing this, so back to your warrant, warrants for safety. Because I, I don't mind, I'm, I'm open to doing something that's outside the warrants if what we're doing is safer. And the warrants require. I'm not interested in doing it if it's unsafe. Sure, and you certainly have that ability. I just have the ability to report to you what the warrants say. Right. And so the warrants would, would not recommend going to uh, 35 for that stretch. Right. So I withdraw my motion. All right, so we have the original motion to pass this as it is in front of us. Ms. Brenner. Um, I'll move to hold in. Do we want to put it in committee? I, I would like to have more of a discussion because it does kind of defy logic to think that that small area of going back and forth like that would be actually safer. I understand about the straightness and the wide um, uh, rights of way or shoulders, but I'm not, yeah, I just, since we didn't really discuss it, I would like to hold this so we can either do it all at once or not. <laughs> Mr. Hutchings. I, I'm sensing a little confusion about the yes. concept of going 35 as you're headed south, going up to 50 miles an hour and then slowing back down to 35. That's not the case. Oh. It's 35 going south until after you pass the turnoff for Galbraith, and then it goes to 50 all the way down to the on-ramp to the interstate oh. where it slows down again. Okay. Does that clarify? That's what happens on the other side Which of the freeway? Which is about 0.6 miles. Right. And then what, what happens on the other side of the freeway? On the other side of the freeway. No, no. Other side of the freeway, it turns into Samish Drive and goes down to the lake, and that's a pretty it's, little windy road, and I think right. we have that at 25 miles down. an hour. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I still withdraw my motion. Okay. Uh, you've moved to hold in committee or something of that nature? Yeah, I'm kind of convinced by what Joe just said that Good. It, it probably, since it's going on to the freeway, which makes total sense. So you're withdrawing your motion? Uh, sure. Okay. And But I have one, um, either uh, Mr. Rattan or Dr. Hutchings, if one or the other. Yeah. I don't really understand what that means. I mean, could you explain that before we vote? A new zigzag line on Highway 9. Well, this would be a new zigzag on the, on Sandwich Way instead. Yes, that is a new that is a striping that has been used in Europe for years. Um, 
where they uh, are designating that there's, you know, potential for pedestrians and whatnot. It's not something that is adopted in the current MUTCD, but it's something that I believe is being allowed as experimental. We can look into that option for you. It's not something that has been used in this state yet that I'm aware of, mm -hmm. but if that, um, but it, it is something that I have seen and potentially could be coming here. Well, what's its official name in case we want to look it up? It looks like zigzag. That's what it is. <laughs> I'll yeah. call it zigzag for now. <laughs> it's, it was interesting. Okay, on Highway 9. So uh, we'll all get a hold of the DOT and, and get their specifications for that, and we'll do some education on, on those. I like to learn okay. about that. All right, so we have the motion to approve this ordinance to reduce the speed limit on a portion of Samish Way. Ms. Brenner. I will remove my motion to hold, but um, I, I, I know that area. I wasn't sure what you were talking about was to go right on the freeway, but the other area, um, it's gotten more and more traffic weekdays, too. I know lots of people who go up there and ride their bikes on weekdays. All right. Any further discussion? Sorry, we've already closed the public hearing. <clears throat> Sorry, we've closed the public hearing. Sorry. Sorry. Mr. Mann. So I'll just speak in favor of it uh, in terms of the parking. I just want to echo what other folks said. There, I've been up to that parking lot a few times, and there are lots of cars, especially the last oh, few years, all through the summer, 10, 12, 15, right down on the shoulder, kind of in the ditch, and lots of people. It, it's, it, it, this is an example, actually, of what we've been talking about, our recreation economy driving uh, tourists here, and we're succeeding, which is great. So now I think we need to adjust to the reality of all these folks coming here to recreate and slow, slow down the speed limit and fix the parking. Fix the parking is a real Okay. Problem. Any other discussion? I think we're ready for the roll call. Barbara Brenner? Yes. Red Brown? Yes. Barry Buchanan? Yes. Pete Kremen? Yes. Ken Mann? Yes. Scott Paul Sadu? Yes. Carl Weimer? Yes. That passes unanimously. We are on to our third. Parking restriction on a portion of Samish Way. It's about the parking along Samish Way. We'd be glad to hear it. Eric. So. Eric Brown, 2305 Vining Street. Uh, I just want to kind of reiterate sort of how this addresses. Uh, basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to give the people from Galbraith Lane at some sort of visual and give also um, people a safe access route to the mountain and that's really with the parking. I've been putting um, just at the request of the neighbors of Galbraith Lane, I've been putting signs up along there and it's actually helped quite a bit and I've gotten done sort of our own little PSAs on Facebook and our website and email list and that's really helped. But we have a lot of Canadians, a lot of people from Seattle who come down who don't know. Those signs eventually either get weathered or they get thrown away or whatever. So long term, it would be great to have something permanent um, to help the neighbors there. We're, at the end of the day, they, they've lived there and, you know, we're the stewards of the mountain. But we also try to be good neighbors. And that's really what this comes down to is trying to, to no fault of their own, they live next to one of the best mountain biking areas in the world. So, you know, that's, that's a great for a lot of people, that's why they live there, but for some of them, it's not so great. So we're trying to be good stewards and good neighbors for those folks. So that's all I have to say. So ultimately, as you know, we're hopefully working on a long-term parking solution, but that's, you know, that's in the process. Um, that's a good Thank you, and thank you in coming for cool. speaking for the neighbors this evening. Mr. Brown. Uh, uh, Eric, sorry, I'd just like your opinion on something. If uh, we're now dropping the speed limit in that area, which should theoretically make the uh, the egress and uh, across from the parking safer. Yes. So, uh, and I'm a little bit concerned that we start shutting down the parking there. What what are people going to do? So specifically, I'm asking for the north side of Sam. We've asked for the north side of Samish Way, um, close to those that driveway uh, or to the to the so that way people can see um, uh, when they're pulling out. It's whether it's 50 or 35. People were pulling up all the way to Galbraith Lane on both sides this past year. We've seen that increasing. 
And even with the signage from time to time, that happens, especially on really, really busy weekends. And so, Rad, what, 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 especially there's a few elderly folks on, the, on, on Galbraith Lane who inch out and then they have to back up. And especially whether it's 50 or 35, it's kind of irrelevant at that point. You know, they're inching out into traffic where it's, there's, no, there's nowhere for them to pull in or out. So that's really um, what it comes down to is that they have no visibility um, sight lines, essentially. So. Okay, thank you. So for other people that haven't seen the map, we're talking about a 500-foot no parking zone on both sides of Gilbreth Lane, just on the north side of Sandwich Way. There was, there was another, um, there's, um, an, I don't know if this is Adam who just left, but there's another neighbor who lives to the south end on the south side, and they've been, people have been parking really close to his house as well. We talked about having some sort of a buffer for that neighbor as well. Um, that's the closest driveway. Um, it's, that didn't get included on this, um, I don't believe, but when I met with Public Works, that was in discussion because I got a request from that neighbor as well. There's, I think there's seven neighbors that, lives up that, that live up that road. And so if you go um, to the, I guess we're saying south, but it's really more southeast end of Galbraith Lane, I forget what that, those neighbors are, but those folks also have that issue because it's not, if they, if they at least had a, a little buffer to pull out, those folks are also having that issue. It's, it's an unfortunate consequence of the popularity of the mountain, so. Ms. Brenner. Thank Can you. anybody? Thanks, Eric. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Carl. Eric. Can anybody from Public Works tell me at? Let, let's how, close the public hearing before we. Uh, oh, okay, close it. Is there anybody else that wants to speak to us about parking along Samish Way? See no one else, I'm gonna close the public hearing. Go ahead. Um, I'd like to know what steps the county's taken about creating safe parking that's not interfering with the neighbors because it's only going to get worse yeah um joe Rutan, public works this was uh spearheaded by our good friend roland middleton at public works and he went out and he met with the uh neighbors out there the um the wimp bicycle people and uh, several other groups he had several on-site meetings out there this no parking was actually um proposed by the residents out there no no that's okay. not my question I'm sorry i support it um to have a like a long-term solution uh, for parking have we have we done anything with that yet yes the uh, parks department is negotiating with the city of bellingham to develop a parking lot up there it is uh, they do not have any agreements or funding yet but it's something that uh they're they are moving on public works. We mentioned that in our documents because we wanted to make sure that you're right. aware this is truly an interim solution and they, a, a true parking lot is the, the true solution. So you don't have any guesstimate as to how long before we'd have anything in the works? No. Okay. Just several years out is what we were being told. Mr. Chairman, I move approval. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Any other discussion? Mr. Mann. Well, we, we, we absolutely need a solution to that sooner than several years out. And I, I've mm -hmm. assumed that it was really the city's job because that's their park right across the street and it's their parking lot. And um, but it's kind of ironic that we're doing the six year plan tonight. Does, would, would that be something that would be on the six year plan if we were doing a parking lot somewhere along there? I don't know if we own any property over there. No, this would not be a transportation program. Okay. It would be a parks okay. program. Uh, all right, well, obviously, I support this, and Eric's, uh, Mr. Brown's point, the audience member, Mr. Brown's point about, you know, folks from out of town, S Seattle, Canada, Arizona, I've seen RVs out there. His signs have really done a great job of directing people across the street for the parking because the visibility is extremely dangerous out there. And also, when you're a biker or a hiker walking across the road, there's nowhere to walk if cars are jamming the whole shoulder. So having parking on one side and visibility and, and safety on the other is, is a great solution and I'm glad um, they brought it forward and they came up with it and I'm going to support it. Any other discussion? We're ready for the roll call. Red Brown? Yes. Barry Buchanan? Yes. Pete Kremen? Yes. Ken Mann? Yes. Satpal Sadu? Yes. Carl Weimer? Yes. Barbara Brenner? Yes. That passes unanimously, and I'm surprised that no one brought up the idea of banning bicycles out there. It's a simple solution. But banning <laughs> bicycles? Yeah, right. All right, we're going to move on to our open session, and this is the place in the agenda where anybody can come down and talk to us whatever they want for three minutes.
kind of same rules apply. If your name is complicated, spell it for us. And at about 30 seconds, when you have about 30 seconds left, you'll get a warning from the clerk that your time's about up. So whoever wants to start us off, come on down. His, this guy. Yeah, why don't we start over here because he's been waiting and I told him it wouldn't be very long and it turned out it was. I apologize. Thank you for your patience. Yeah, the topic here is, uh, it has to do with the critical area ordinance. We need your name. I'm sorry, my name is John Patton. P-A-T-T-E-N. Net neutrality, what is that? Well, it's a concept that means in relation to an area that if a particular type of land is removed or altered, an equal or equivalent needs to be developed to compensate for the lack that has been created. And I'm, I'm quite sure you're all familiar with the concept. But there, there's a phrase in there that uh, I, I feel very passionate that needs to go away. Uh, the reason why um, is because if we mandate that a person use property for only one thing, in this case, critical areas or wetlands or whatever it is, um, and we insist on that use, then we have violated the principle of property, and that's very important to society. Um, beyond that, we've taken property away from a person without just compensation for the taking. Um, or put more simply, we have stolen those rights. And uh, that's why I'm passionate about it. We're above that in Whatcom County. Slice it any way you like, you'll arrive at the same place. To take something that is not yours is to steal. It has always been wrong, it's wrong today, and it will continue to be wrong for all time. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with the Washington State Constitution, but by, by way of reminder, I'm quoting a portion of Chapter 136, and I quote, no private property shall be taken or damaged for public or private use without just compensation having been made. Uh, end quote. A similar language is also written into the Bill of Rights of the United States Constitution. <coughs> Very similar. Additionally, in 2006, the Washington State Attorney General has warned that excessive regulation of property can become an actual taking, quote unquote. And uh, it is therefore unconstitutional, opening the jurisdiction to lawsuits. Above all, we know that to take pri private property rights is wrong and tantamount to theft. I will be happy to supply the link to his statements on taking. I have a copy here if you're interested. Contrary to the host closely held beliefs of many uh, environmentalists, mainly, a person who owns property just might want to build something on it, or he might want to uh, um, fulfill his obligation to provide shelter for his family and protection. Uh, he might also want to farm or do something else that's legally um, proper. 30 seconds, please. Thank you. A property owner should have the right to do so as long as he's not negatively affecting the rights of the surrounding property owners or negatively affecting public waterways. This is our moral imperative. Um, furthermore, to, re to take or excessively restrict private property can have additional negative effects if private property is restricted to the point that it cannot be used for construction and housing. The supply of housing will be restricted and will be out of balance with demand this can cause extremely high housing costs. Time. I've heard that Whatcom County leads the state in the unaffordable index of housing. We'd like to change that. Um, to summarize, so-called net neutrality is, it is currently in law as in use is properly speaking theft of property rights. Stealing has always been and always will be wrong. And by way of application, the net, neutra net neutrality language ought to be immediately removed from the current critical areas ordinance and replaced with language that is both morally correct and constitutional. Thank you. Um, could you leave a copy of that and your phone number? I, I'm not sure. I mean, I know what you're talking about, but um, I think we're already aware and make sure that we are careful about not taking away someone's property rights or we're over excessive, whatever. And and that's debatable probably, but I wanna see what you're specifically talking about. If you could leave it with your phone yeah, number. I'll, I'll put my name and phone number on Thank it. You. Thank you, perfect. All right, thank you. Thank you. My name is Peter Willing. 
I am here to speak to you about the county conditional use permit process, the way it is working, or in my opinion, not. I have spoken to you before on this subject. In June 2012, the Whitecomb County Hearing Examiner issued CUP 2009-0006 for Glen Echo Garden. This permit contains specific conditions relating to lighting. Lighting, pursuant to Whatcom County Code, any lights used to illuminate a parking lot shall be so arranged as to direct the light away from the adjoining property in the public road. Greenhouse lighting, the applicant shall immediately cease using the current lighting system for the plants in the greenhouse and instead install full cutoff lights designed for greenhouse growing. Lighting for greenhouses shall not illuminate or impact neighboring properties. The permit holder, Dick Bosch, has never complied with either of these provisions. He operates his greenhouse lights from the last week of December until Mother's Day in May. Bosch also maintains a powerful mercury vapor light in the parking lot in front of his house, which he operates year-round in the dark hours. All the lights intrude severe trespass light into our house and into, our, into my bedroom, despite a blackout curtain. I brought this issue to the notice of your Planning and Development Services Office every year. That's for four years now since the permit was issued. They have offered a variety of excuses for why the situation has not been remedied. They told me in so many words, Jack will not back us up on this issue. I ask you, how did PDS staff get this perception, perception that the executive would not back them up on performing their legally constituted responsibilities? PDS said, the permittee has told us he's shielded the lights, but they have made no site visit verification, and in fact, he has done no such thing. They have told me there are other, many other details of his operation for which he has not obtained final permits. Bosch promised retaliation for our complaints in April 2015, writing to us, quote, if I find out more about, com find out about more complaining, there will be light shining in your direction 365 days a year, unquote. The Mercury Vapor Yard Light was shielded in our direction for a number of years, but as of this writing, the shield has been removed. This pattern of non-enforcement concerns me beyond the matter of greenhouse lights, which are a nuisance to me, an inconvenienced neighbor. But if this is a sample of how the county is to operate, it raises some serious questions. How can we justify an expensive and elaborate planning, permitting, and quasi-judicial review system 30 seconds, that appears please. to be a dead letter, and which has no reliable outcome or protection for people who have to live with the, with the consequences of activities that are supposed to be regulated? If the county can't manage lights in a greenhouse, how can it be expected to manage the consequences of far larger land use decisions that protect, potentially affect everybody? I submit to you that the process is broken, and I implore you to see that it gets fixed. Thank you. Thank you. Chair. Ms. Brenner. Do you have that written thing where you quoted that person? Yes, I believe I did share that with you, Barbara. Is okay, but right? I mean, do you have it? Oh, yes, I do. Okay. Um, I'm thinking, Tyler, who's sitting right there, it would be helpful if you could give him those comments. And, I will do that. And maybe get a copy of the, the quote from him, for yes. him. Thanks. Okay. I think actually what Tyler would need is a copy of the original document. Right. Yeah, I think that's what she's oh. saying, that he needs okay. a copy of the letter. Yeah. No, but as opposed to just the quote, I think he needs the whole No, I, that's what I said. Okay. The Tyler Schroeder, Executive's Office. I'll follow up with the gentleman and get the information needed. I know that Jack's aware of the CUP and the conditions associated with Glen Echoes, and we'll be working with PDS on the issue. As it and up. a copy of the letter where the person said that, that would Correct. be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Teresa Sigatowis, East part of Whatcom County. Uh, preface uh, my remarks with these uh, remarks are not directed to Councilmember Bremer, who, Brenner, who I have the utmost respect for. The past week, two of the things that I did was to read the public disclosure emails from this council and watch the Pope's visit on TV. Listening to Pope Francis's words and actions caused me to think about integrity. And it occurred to me that nowadays, 
We don't give integrity as much attention as we should. Integrity is the foundation stone of good public service. So tonight, think about integrity and its importance. If you pray, include it in your prayers and ask yourself, would the boy you were be proud of the man you are today? Integrity, just think about it. I'm going to call these to this council. Thank you. Anybody else? You're in open session. Hi, my name is Lynn Barton. I live in Bellingham. Um, I just wanted to ask for all of you to appoint um, Wendy Harris to the Wildlife Advisory Committee because she has really helped spearhead this concept, and she's not here tonight. Um, and the reason why I'm asking you to do this in part um, is because I believe a wildlife advisory committee is really important. For instance, just two days ago, even though I live in the city, we had a deer who did not realize that a neighbor of mine had just put up a fence, and it was it's a white, thin metal fence, and it um, was chased by a dog, and it didn't realize that it was there, and it just slammed into it and broke both of its front legs. This is the third deer in three months in my neighborhood that's been killed by accidental predatory. Be it um, a car, you know, or a dog or whatever. So my point is, if this is happening in my neighborhood, and you look at this exponentially, what's happening in the rest of the county? So it really is important. I mean, I'm just heartbroken over it. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else during the public session? Seeing no one else, I'm going to close the uh, public open session and we're going to move right on to our consent agenda.